So uh, Samuel grew up in the temple just doing his regular chores. For all intents and purposes, he was handed over to the temple by his mother, dedicated to him, and uh, dedicated to Eli, working for Eli, filling the oil and the candles and making sure there's hymnal, prayer book, hymnal, prayer book, or vice versa, whatever it should be the right order. Um, and he was doing his job, never asked any questions, doing what um, Eli told him to do, and turns out he didn't even know God in the process. The author said, the word of the Lord was rare in those days. Visions were not widespread. The people kept coming to worship, offering their sacrifices, singing the songs and prayers, and yet they still weren't listening. So it's not surprising that when the 12-year-old Samuel hears a voice, he just assumes it's Eli. It's the only voice he's ever responded to the whole time. And so he was neither Eli, uh, the first nor the last to fall asleep in church. Uh, and Samuel keeps hearing his voice and keeps waking up snoring Eli and says, what do you want? What do you want? He said, it wasn't me. It wasn't me. Go back to sleep. You're waking me up. Go back to sleep. Finally, he hears it again. Eli says, hmm, it's been a long time since we've heard this voice, but maybe this is God. Go back. If you hear it again, say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. And he does. And after he hears that voice of God, Samuel's life is never the same. In fact, it is harder. Martin Luther King Jr. came from a long line of preachers in his family. Like Samuel, he too grew up in the church. But Dr. King wrote, it was kind of inherited religion, and I had never felt the experience of God in the way you must if you're going to walk the lonely paths of the Christian life. He even became the pastor of Dexter Avenue Baptist Church without having had a first-hand experience of God, he said, and then Rosa Parks. And suddenly, Dr. King found himself as in the middle of a boycott. At 27, he is quickly the leader of a movement that changes the world. Soon the threatening phone calls began to blow up his house and his very life. We're tired of you. If you aren't out of here, we're going to blow your brains out. He later said, I prayed a prayer that night out loud, and it seemed to me in that moment that I could hear a voice saying to me, Martin Luther, stand up for righteousness, for justice, for the truth, and I will be with you even to the end of the ages. I heard the voice of Jesus say, fight on. After Dr. King heard the voice of God in the middle of the light, his voice and life were never the same. In fact, it was harder. Now most of us looking around here inherited our religion, our faith, perhaps even our denomination. It is not good or bad, it just is. And despite the fact, we are still here today. The majority of us are not here because we feel obligated or guilty. Most of us are over that or have been to therapy. <laughs> we are here because we need to be here on this icy morning. We are here because we know we are hungry and we want to be fed. The word of the Lord was rare in those days, though. Visions were not widespread. That was the verse that broke our hearts at Vestry Meeting when we studied this on Monday night, and it still seems way too familiar. It is as if the writer sent these email words to us this morning. So perhaps we are like Samuel this morning. And God is calling us to do something, to say something. We are here because at some point in our lives, we heard or experienced the voice of God, the still small voice, or a voice in the middle of the night. Perhaps it was a fleeting moment and you are hoping to hear it again. But the Holy Spirit has brought you for a reason, and whatever that reason is, whatever it is this morning, of all mornings, it is important. 
and you have done well to listen. You get extra credit for being here today. You didn't know that. But I know that professing your faith and being here does not make your life any easier. In fact, it makes it harder. So what is God calling you to say or do today or tomorrow or ten years from now? What would happen if we actually heard and followed God's voice? Or perhaps like Eli, God is speaking to someone around us. And we are just asleep in church. Maybe, and I know this to be true of some of you, you are the wise elder who knows the voice of God and can help someone else discern what it is they're supposed to do. Or maybe even convince that person that it is God talking to them. It does not make your life any easier. In fact, it is harder. But you have experience. And maybe God is calling you to help others listen and discern what that is tingling in their ears. Either way, God is calling us into relationship. It is what our baptismal vows that we renewed last week are all about. Being in relationship with God and each other. And if I'm correct... And God is saying that to us, then life will never be the same. In fact, it is hard to For any of you in any relationship of any kind, if you're married, have been married, you know that it is lovely, but it is not easy. In fact, it is harder. <laughs> but what if we did, what if we as Episcopalians and members of the church started acting like we were Christians in relationship? What if we started acting as if we hear and listen and follow the word of the Lord? What if we are the ones to start producing the visions of the Lord in our world today? When Martin Luther King was in jail in Birmingham in 63, he wrote, I'm cognizant of the interrelatedness of all communities and states, I cannot sit idly by in Atlanta and not be concerned about what's going on in Birmingham. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. Never again can we afford to live with the narrow provincial outside agitator idea. Anyone who lives inside the U.S. can never be considered an outsider anywhere within its boundaries. Caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, a single garment of destiny. We need to be in relationship with one another, and we have not always done that well, my friends. We have done those things which we ought not to have done and left undone those things which we ought to have done. We need to start acting like Christians. Ironically or not, it is the dedicated on the church calendar, Week of Christian Unity. We just dedicated a week to it. God forbid we dedicate a whole year to acting like Christians. Our hope is found in God, and God cannot work alone. God needs our flesh and bones, no matter what our denomination or belief, to put hope and faith into action and start creating visions. To listen for guidance and get to work. To be honest about our own prejudices and those that lie deep within us. We are afraid to admit them, but we have to start and repent and let go of our hatred and apathy and cling to our hope and promise of a new beginning. We are called to gather to worship let that worship and experience move us to respond and say to God as Samuel did, Speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. We are the ones called to be servants of the living God, bringing hope alive in the world. We have problems and challenges of all kinds. We can no longer wait for other Samuels to rise up to fix them. We are the Samuels and the Martins that need courage to take a stand and to speak 
when it would be easier to remain silent. To find and be Eli and share our wisdom to raise up those around us who may be the chosen leaders for the next step. In 63, in that same letter from J.L. Butler King, wrote, The judgment of God is upon the church as never before. If today's church does not recapture the sacrificial spirit of the early church, it will lose its authenticity, forfeit the loyalty of millions, and be dismissed as an irreverent social club with no meaning for the 20th century. Every day I meet young people whose disappointment with the church has turned into outright disgust. Fifty-two years later, those words still break my heart. We must bring the vision of hope back to the church. A sense of authenticity instead of hypocrisy. So it is up to us, the potential is up to us now to recapture that sacrificial spirit that Dr. King speaks about in the church and turn that disappointment into promise. Perhaps it seems like bad news on this icy morning, but I believe we can and are doing it. In order to be in relationship with one another, we have to give a few things up, like the status quo, like the claim that we are always right. We may have to curb spending and our consumption and let go of our greed and isolation and cut back on our complaining and pessimism and comments, because hope abounds and will overcome. It is now our turn to meet the challenge and face the future with the courage of Samuel and Martin and the wisdom of Eli. We are called to be disciples of hope, being led into relationship with one another, into mutuality, with Jesus and one another. It is not easy, in fact, it is harder. But with God's help and the love of one another, we go out into the world as servants. And then our hope will finally 